here to talk to you today about the mentality of skilled innovation. And you're going to most probably think, well, what on earth is he on about, mentality of skilled innovation? So what I'm going to, going to tell you a story. And it's 1962 in rural Argentina, literally in the middle of nowhere. And there's a boy there who's a baker's son. And he's seven years of age. And he's really fascinated by balsa wood how light it is, but yet how strong it is. And he's a keen model maker. And one day, he's made a beautiful model, and he takes it into his mother and says, Mum, one day, I'm going to make the most beautiful car in the world. And like all good mothers, she says what, she, what everybody says, which is, of course you are, son. Of course you are. But she knew in her heart, if it all went wrong, he could still come and work in his dad's bakery. So anyway, the boy got older, and he started tinkering with engineering stuff, building motorbikes and this sort of thing. Then he discovered a love for Leonardo da Vinci and that weird mix between art and science and how they could be combined into one thing. He then discovered another amazing material, glass fiber. And once again, he liked how strong it was, but also super light. And he set up a shop in the middle of rural Argentina, actually making parts for the local farmers' wagons. He got pretty good at it, and his business grew, and he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. I'm going to start and build a Formula 2 racing car, which is absolutely an insane thing to do. Nevertheless, he started with his friends, and they built the chassis for this racing car, and one day, they towed it to the head office of Renault Argentina. And they said, hey, I'm going to build a Formula 2 racing car with this chassis. Please, will you give us an engine? And he persuaded them to actually hand over an engine to him. So he went out, he built his car out of glass fiber, and it was 40 kilograms lighter, 40 kilograms lighter than the other vehicles, his nearest best competitor. And he went out racing, but of course, he didn't have the money to compete with the bigger teams. He had some success, but he just couldn't keep it going. And he had some failure. And he had to go back into his rural shop. And he says, you know, I'm sick of this. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to sell up, and I'm going to move to Italy. I want to actually go ahead and build a beautiful car. I'm going to go to Italy and do it. So they sold everything up. He was married at that, that time. Sold everything up, and he moved into a tent in Modena in Italy. And he applied to each and every car manufacturer there, and there was only one person who came back to him, and that was Lamborghini. And they said, the only job we've got for you at the moment is sweeping the floor in the body shop. That's the only job we've got. He said, I'll take it. Absolutely no problem, I'll take that job. Because I'm telling you, you're going to love what I can do for you. And he went into the body shop, and with a very, very short space of time, two or three years, he was actually designing the Lamborghini Countach. 25th anniversary from sweeping the floors to being the main designer. He then discovered carbon fiber. That was his latest material. And he went to the bosses. He thought this is going to be an absolutely great thing, this carbon fiber. It's super light. It's got great application for automotive. I'm actually going to go. And he went to see his boss at Lamborghini. He said, I think we should buy an autoclave so that we can have an oven and make our own carbon fiber. It's the future. And the boss at Lamborghini, like all good bosses, said, Ferrari doesn't have an autoclave, therefore, we don't need one. So, by that time, he'd moved out of the tent and he got a house. He sold his house, he remortgaged it, and actually went and bought an autoclave. And that young boy in Italy, seven years old, eventually formed the company that became... Pagani, you know, one of the world's greatest car manufacturers. And Horatio Pagani is a great example of the sort of person who has an innovation but able to scale it on a global scale. All, not all, most of the world's tech billionaires are friends of Mr. Horatio Pagani and have his cars. And the one car that you've been looking at in the screen there is the Pagani Hira Roadster. That was released at Geneva this year. 
And that car is a total work of art and it's 2.4 million euros to buy. 2.4 million euros to buy. Yet, there's only 100 of them being made, yet every single one of them was sold before a physical car existed. And the technology that they were sold in is actually zero light. And that's where we come into the business. And we'll tell you a little bit about our story. So basically what Zero Light does is take car manufacturers CAD and via an automated process turn it into a living and breathing car model. So you can open the doors, open the boots, it can be any single colour, any single possible configuration. And the thing that drives us is that we believe customers deserve an amazing buying experience. It's really that simple. And one of the worst buying experiences is unfortunately buying a new car currently. If you actually drill down into those customers, and let's put them into, get even closer into them, 100 dots there, the one thing that absolutely polarizes them is that they hate the new car buying experience. Over 80% of people intensely dislike it. You know, of the 20% at the bottom, who don't think it's too bad, only 1%, 1% say that they like the process of buying a car. And unfortunately, most of the wrath of those customers fall down on the poor old salesperson. So this, per this job hasn't changed in over 50 years. Even if you went into any deal in Newcastle today and you got the best deal in the country on that particular car, you'll still walk out there thinking, could have got a better deal. <laughs> could have got a better deal. Could have got a better deal. So basically, what Zero Light does is we replace an age-old problem in the, in the car dealership, which is you can never see the car you're going to buy. Your car is always like that one over there, that one's silver, yours will be black, that's got the big alloy wheels, yours will have the little alloy wheels. It's just a terrible, terrible experience. So what we've done for the likes of Audi and Jaguar Land Rover is took cars out of the showroom and replaced them with massive screens. But the one difference with Zero Light is you can see every single car, every single option, roof racks, cycle racks, every single possible permutation for the Audi range. There's more possible permutations than grains of sand on the planet. And you can see them instantly. So... Obviously, once we moved into retail, we started to go under online. Car configuration online is terrible. You get a load of static shots that don't, as soon as you get into any level of complexity, it can't be shown. What we've done is replaced that with a totally interactive 3D car. And then finally, what we're looking at currently is online automotive advertising. You know, people are making all of their decisions now online in terms of buying a car. On average, the person spends 14 hours looking at it. But what you can see when I talk later about scale, you can see from the modest beginnings there, our aim has always been to move in that direction. So that's enough about Zero Light. I'm just going to show you a one-minute clip of the sort of stuff that we've been doing over the last three years that we've been in existence, and then I'll talk a little bit about the thought processes that got us here. So really, I'm now going to talk a little bit. I can't help you to form your own companies, but I can tell you a little bit behind the mentality that enabled us to do what we've done and got big brands like these and others coming and saying, hey, we're quite interested in what you're doing. How can we use you? How can we use you worldwide? And pretty much, 
it falls down to three areas, and I think it's going to be a popular theme for today. One is the plan, secondly is the people, and thirdly is the culture. Because you need a specific culture for innovation and disruption. I think the first thing we're going to talk about is a BHAG. Does anybody, I'm sure most people have heard what a BHAG is, a big, hairy, audacious goal. So when JFK said he was going to put the man on the moon, you know, he didn't tell you how he was going to do it, how much he was going to spend, when it was going to be done, all that other fantastic stuff. He just said, no, we're going to put a man on the moon. Everybody needs that big moonshot vision that drives your company. You know, in Zero Light, we want to be the visualization platform that fundamentally changes how people purchase cars. You know, that's our BHAG. And the thing is about it, they're not smart, they're not measurable, they're not achievable, they're not necessarily realistic, there's no time scale to them or anything like that. All that doesn't matter. They interviewed 200 high achieving entrepreneurs, sports people, all of them had a BHAG not, that they were operating to, not one of them had anything that was smart. Mr. Pagani, as a young child, when he said, I want to make the most beautiful car in the world, he didn't tell you when he was going to do it, it took him a while to get there, but that's, what it's all, that's actually what it's all about. The next thing, once you have your BHAG, you need to come up with a plan. Now, with zero light, innovation happens fast. There's no point in doing a plan that's going to last for the next three or four years. Everything that we do is written down on one sheet of A4 paper. The actions that we're going to take this year to get towards our BHAG. And it's simple. It's used with the VCs as well. They like it. They read it. And the number of people who produce massive business plans, like Mark did, that people never end up reading, unfortunately. I'm sure they read yours, Mark. But, it, you know, it's, it's, it's actually... Uh, Everybody can grasp what's on a sheet of A4. And what it does, the most important thing when you're a startup is avoid distraction. Set yourself really a target. It's zero light. We've got a target that we'll not actually engage with anybody unless we can see a SaaS deal coming out of it of a minimum value. So literally we get brochure all the time. Can you do virtual reality uh, washing powder? Can you do virtual reality chocolate bars? We're not interested because there's not that scale there. It's just a distraction. When you've got your plan, you've got to share it with each and every member of staff regularly, all the time, reinforce it. You know, this is, this is our lot. We're just over the, over, the, over the river, on the other side of the water. And this was a big presentation that we did. We'd done a presentation for a major German motor, motor manufacturer. And in that presentation, each and every person in the room had done one bit of it, but they'd never seen how it all fitted together. And it just allowed everybody in the room to take an hour out of the day. Hey, this is what we pitched. This is what you did. Well done you. Well done you. Well done everybody, because everybody did this. And it makes the difference between your job can either be filling sandbags, or your job can be filling sandbags to save New Orleans from flooding. And the only difference is between that is communication in and amongst your team. The next thing is people. We're moving on to the next stage, you know. And the Avengers are a good example of this. You know, it's exactly the same as what Mark said, you know, whole versus something else. <laughs> you know, it, it, literally, it literally is. You need to hand select your team. It's the most important skill that you can learn. And what you're looking for, really, are people with superpowers. Now, unfortunately, people with superpowers aren't evenly distributed around the world. You know, they're hard to come by. And what do we mean by the six things that we look for, the six superpowers? We're looking for detail. And detail are the six things that no university teaches. And each time we interview somebody, we're trying to say, Have, has this person got at least one of these details? And their determination, energy, talent, attitude, integrity, and life experiences. You can't learn that anywhere. There's no, <laughs> there's no university course teaches that. You either have it or you don't. So if we drill down one at a time, the determination person is the fish, not the bear. Somebody has to point that out. <laughs> so <laughs> the fish needs to get up. Now, determination is a one thing that you see a lot with entrepreneurs. It's mainly, mainly the one skill that most entrepreneurs have got. Even when things get utterly desperate, 
utterly, utterly, utterly desperate, you somehow find the determination to keep on going. You know, it's a real, real skill, and you either have it or you don't. The next one I love is energy. Everybody knows a low energy person. The person when you go, morning, and they go, oh, so tired. I was just, the bus, I had to walk from the bar, absolutely. They sap your energy. They sap the energy of the team. For them to survive, they need your energy to survive just to function, you know? But on the other end, high energy people are utterly, utterly the most amazing thing in the world. I've got a guy that I employ, a Dutch guy, and I said, would you mind going to live in Silicon Valley? Because we need somebody to go and conquer in America. And he was like, yes, I'll do that. Straight away, over. And he's basically taken on America by storm. He's got zero life flight cases, traveling across America. He's unstoppable. He's just naturally high energy. The other thing is talent. Now, I, I love this. It's, this is like throwing knives, you know, it's just a... Uh, there's so many things wrong with this photograph. I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but never mind, we'll move on. Um, talent is such a person with natural talent is such a wonderful thing. A wonderful, wonderful thing. So I'm a guitarist. And when I was young, I used to play in bands. And thanks to Herb, wherever he is, I've even graced this stage playing. But I'm not a natural guitarist. I've had a fortune spent on lessons. I practice, I practice, and practice. But if I come across a natural guitarist, a person with natural talent, I could literally throw myself on the floor and sob. Because I know, no matter how hard I work, I'm never going to be as good as that guitarist. Never, ever. I might as well go home and chop up my guitar collection for firewood. Because I'm never going to be that person. Attitude. Attitude is absolutely if you've got a creative company if you've got an innovative company attitude is absolutely everything and there's only two types of people in this world there's radiators and there's drains mm. All right and we, we know we know a number of people who fall into both so the main thing is about if you have somebody with positive attitude they bring energy into the room, they light up the room. No matter how bad you're feeling, they can always see the, they can always see the good in everything. They're an you need to fill your company with radiators. It makes every day a pleasure. If you're looking to innovate and be creative and things work and things don't work, you need radiators to say, hey, you're going to keep on going. It's absolutely great. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. We'll work it out. You know? Drains, on the other hand, people with bad attitude you, you can't tolerate them in, in your company. Each and every person in this room now has got a picture in their mind of the person that they work with <laughs> that has got bad attitude. And yet you tolerate it. Yet you tolerate it. You're quite happy to have somebody with bad attitude in your company. If you do nothing else today, go home and work out what you're going to do to move that person on. Find, get them somewhere where they're going to be happy. You know, it's the, best, it's the best thing that you can do. And the bad thing about, ra about drains is they're the welcoming committee for your new employees. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so radiators, not drains. Integrity. Poor old Lance Armstrong. If you allow your integrity to be brought into question once, or the integrity of your company to be brought into question once, it's gone forever. There's no second chances with integrity. If somebody comes for an interview and says, ah, Darren, I'll come along and I'll bring all the customers from my old company and then we'll go about and I'll steal all the staff. You can be guaranteed if I give that person a job, he'll be sitting in my competitor's room in 18 months telling them exactly the same thing. Don't tolerate it. Finally, life experience is... It's all about the journey. It's not about what degree you've got, or how many, whether you've got an MBA, or whether you went to Cambridge, or Oxford, or anything like that. It's about what you overcame to get there. You know? Did you go to live in Japan? Did you live in America? Did you have some tragedy of childhood that you got over? You know, that's, that's really the, the thing it's all about with life experiences. Nobody teaches you life experiences. You've got to go learn them yourself. So, you've got the people, you've got the plan, 
What about the culture? The culture does come from the top down. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But your job as a leader is to make other leaders. If you make other leaders, your company can scale. If all you do is basically produce followers, your company's never going to scale. And really, I encourage everybody to look at Simon Sinek. He's absolutely, he's absolutely amazing on this, and this is most of his stuff. But pretty much what you've got is a company, this is the circle of safety. So this is Zero Light. And everybody in Zero Light is looking out for each other, but all the way around Zero Light is danger, maybe from competitors, from uh, new innovations or new hardwares. But to innovate, we have to keep everybody in that company safe. It has to be like a family. There has to be trust. So when somebody's off at the edge of danger here, innovating, you know, they need to know if it doesn't work out, we've got their back. We're, we're with them. We're going to care for them. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work. It's going to be okay. If you get this right, all the features here on the left begin to develop in your business. You know, people see the opportunities. They can get the chance to go into leadership. You know, they feel well supported. They're no longer thinking about, what, hey, what's in it for me? But it's more like, what's in it for my company? In sick companies, unfortunately, you get this sort of stuff appearing. And once again, it's all about your mentality. Innovation or disruption generally, if you're going to empower people, they're going to fail. You know, everybody fails. That's what innovation's all about. It's, you're lucky if you get a, a moderate success rate, you know. So you need to empower people to fail. And you need to fail fast. Minimal viable product, get it out. If it's not working, do something about it. So you've got a success if you manage to kill something early that's losing your money, it's just not working. You say, hey, well done, we killed that early, we saved ourselves a load of money. That's it. And I think one of the best TED Talks I've ever heard, I was running across the town moor in Newcastle, which is a rare sight, and I play the TED Talks, and this lady, Linda Clyde Wayman, is, she's a uh, headmistress in an inner city school in Philadelphia. And this is one heck of a rough school. And when she was talking through her talk, I actually started to cry, which is hard to cry and run at the same time, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but as I, because she says a lot of brilliant, brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff, but that one, one of the most, I didn't cry over this bit, but this is a bit, the bit I like most is she says, so what, now what, when bad things happen? How many times do you, you Something goes wrong, you analyze it, you put it to bed, you move on. So what, now what? You know, if you dwell in the past, that's where you're going to be, that's where you're going to be kept. And in terms of summing up, is as an entrepreneur, or in life generally, never, ever, 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 ever give up. Never, ever, ever, ever give up. Because if you give up, you're already gone. You know, and I mean never ever. And I think we start off with Horatio Pagani and we're going to end up with Henry Ford. And this quote is all about belief. You know, whether, 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 you, whether you think inside that you, you're going to get to where you Is your BHAG achievable? And what he says is whether you think you can or that you can't, you are usually right. So I believe that each and every person, if you've got that belief in the room, has got the ability to go back and innovate and work in great companies and I wish you all the best with it. Thank you very much.